Welcome everyone. My name is Carla Durlikov Canales, and I have the pleasure of moderating our panel today. Please know that this panel will be recorded and posted on Meridian's YouTube channel in the coming days. I sincerely want to thank Meridian Center for Cultural Diplomacy for bringing this incredible panel together and for giving me the opportunity to moderate today's discussion. Please allow me to introduce our remarkable guests. Chef Art Smith is the executive chef and co-owner of Blue Door Kitchen and Garden, Reunion and Homecoming Florida Kitchen and Southern Shine at Disney Springs at Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando. His latest restaurant will be at the Orlando, Florida International Airport opening this year. Art loves the idea of bringing people together through food. He has spent the last eight years traveling the world as a culinary ambassador engaging in his passion to bridge the cultural divides through culinary exchange. He visited five countries with the US State Department, including Israel and Azerbaijan. As a member of the Culinary Diplomacy Project, Art has continued this important work through numerous projects, including the most recent trip to Jordan with four other American celebrity chefs. Stacy White, is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Professional and Cultural Exchanges for the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State. She is responsible for overseeing a broad array of professional youth, cultural, sports, and tech camps in their exchange programs for the US and international participants. Stacy is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service and has served as Foreign Service Officer for more than 30 years. She has served as an American diplomat abroad at U.S. embassies in Canada, Mexico, Finland, Panama, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Most recently, Stacy was Minister Counsel for Public Affairs in Ottawa, Canada, where she spent most of 2020 as the Acting De Deputy Chief of Mission. She considers this the best job in the State Department and loves being in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. She's a great believer in the transformational power of people-to-people -people exchanges. And finally, Pedro Reyes designs ongoing projects that narrate playful solutions to critical social problems that impact all of us. Through his art form, Pedro transforms existing problems into ideas for a better world. He addresses complex subjects like political and economic challenges that are retold in ways that are easy to understand by a broader community. Originally trained as an architect, Pedro is acutely aware of how people interact with the built environment with many of his works taking the form of enclosures. Pedro's awards are numerous and they include the US Department of State Medal for the Arts and a Ford Foundation Fellowship. He has had major exhibitions at the Hammer Museum in LA, ICA Miami, Beijing Biennial, Queens Museum, Liverpool Biennial, and so on. So please join me in thanking our guests for being here today. And before we begin our discussion, I hope you will allow me to share a few words. As an artist and as a US arts envoy, I've seen culture used as a vital tool to invent important agendas. Culture has been a part of diplomacy as long as there has been diplomacy. Ancient societies displayed and exchanged works of art to demonstrate their advancement and their worldview. But for all the clear value and essential role of cultural diplomacy, we are only scratching the surface of understanding its power. After all, in the internet age, cultural connections are possible with everyone, everywhere, anytime. Like right now, for example. New forms of art and communication are of revolutionizing societies, politics, and economics. And yet, it's fair to say that cultural diplomacy has not been well understood. It's not always been well-funded, and it's been underutilized as a vital, vital source of soft power. I'm encouraged to see that this is changing, starting with this wonderful day, Culture Fix, which Meridian is hosting for all of us. In addition, the G20 has recently launched a ministerial track for culture members, recognizing that the creative industries may soon grow to represent over 10% of global GDP. So the questions we wanna to answer today with this program have to do with how cultural diplomacy can and is making a difference today. To start, let me turn to Art Smith. Art, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. 
Could you please explain for us more broadly the role of culinary arts as, effective, as an effective tool in bringing people together around traditional values and shared challenges? In essence, how can cultural arts serve as an effective tool for diplomacy and cross-cultural understanding? Well, you know, we all have a mother. And the first thing our mother does is feeds us. And there's a one great lesson our mothers teach us. And that lesson is to share our food. Everyone in the world has a mother. Everyone in the world is taught those lessons. Culinary arts only expresses an education in cooking. I'm a cook, I feed people. Chef is my job, my profession. When you bring people together and sit down at the table, it's the most effective way to come together. One of the most beautiful uh, compliments is to be invited to someone's table, but also to try to understand how the food came to the table. Like today we have peanuts from Africa and collard greens. And I just read where watermelon seeds were found in the Pharaoh's tomb. You know, we enjoy so much of the world already that we don't even really understand because we don't know where our food comes from. So as a chef, I venture out into the world with some knowledge of where I'm going and I've done my research, but, but the idea is I don't want to set up a pretense that the chef is coming to visit or the chef is coming to show us his food ways. I'm coming to exchange food ways together. I'm come to fuse these wonderful flavors and cultures all together. To me, there are no angry people, just hungry people. And with the diplomatic culinary project as chefs we go we venture out we go to the syrian refugee camp we sit with the women and we make these wonderful dishes together and we talk and you know i've been in south africa where i sat with the girls and i talked with them and i explained to the school the importance of millipop being in the school because the millipop says home remember as we venture out into the world americans in general we travel we travel so much but we move so, such around so much, we really don't know or remember what home feels like. Well, we remember what home tastes like. So as a culinary professional, let's just put that on the side. That's a job that really, as a person that feeds people, we're just there to feed people. And I truly do believe that, again, if you want people to come, you feed them. If you want people to stay, you keep feeding them. If you really want to create change, you feed them more. Well said, Art. I, I really value what, what you speak of. And, and personally, I'm hooked. I'm there. So uh, <laughs> thank you for what you're well, doing. Thank you. And turning to Stacy, um, having served for over 30 years as a foreign service officer for the State Department, could you speak more broadly about the role of cultural exchange in fostering effective peace building and reconciliation? Yes, of course. Thank you, Carla. And thank you, Meridian, for inviting me here today, too. You know, without people like Art and Pedro and Carla and Meridian Institution, we wouldn't be able to do what we do, which is to try to match up our wonderful American artists and cultural leaders with uh, people around the world so that they can share a, a very important part of Americans, the American soul really through our culture. Um, our Bureau believes strongly in the power of cultural exchange to build relationships and support policies that lead to peace and reconciliation. We, re we recently dedicated the month of April to cultural diplomacy and Secretary Blinken, who is our Secretary of State, and himself a musician who really gets the importance and the role of culture in the world said that cultural exchange programs are crucial diplomatic tools that increase cross-cultural understanding and demonstrate shared values, creating space for discussions and dialogue between different countries and cultures. And as Art just said, really the way it works the best is through an actual exchange. Uh, we, we have to um, understand and appreciate 
each other's culture in order to know where we're coming from. And so many of the issues of the world, they transcend your own local borders and country borders. So we have to find in this greater world that we're living in uh, all sorts of forms to bring people together. Um, peace building and reconciliation, it lends itself especially well to cultural diplomacy. I think the founding director of Next Level Hip Hop and Conflict Transformation Program, which is the program that we uh, that we uh, partner with Meridian to do around the world, he said he asked a Serbian break dancer in a kind of a uh, a break dance and a dance festival in that part of the world if tension and rivalry arose when hip hop artists from different Balkan countries gathered for festivals. And the dancer said, not at all. You can't fight when you're dancing together. And let me just add one other really quick story. <laughs> my problem when I'm asked to do these things is that my head is full of all so many exciting different ways that we are, we're doing this around the world. It's hard to not, not talk about them all. Well, but that's we what we're here time. for, Stacey. We want to hear the stories. <laughs> Okay, well, I've just got one more quick one then. Um, we, have an, we have other programs that bring international artists to the United States. And these are usually from countries that are important to us in some way, uh, but that may have difficult issues at home, or we as Americans just really don't understand very much about where they're coming from. And that's called Center Stage. And the very first year that we had this program, uh, Pakistan was one of the countries that participated in that with us. And there was a group that we helped support travel around the United States. I think they met with, like 40,000 people and had uh, miles crossed across the nation. And they were musicians that blended contemporary music with uh, traditional music. And uh, at one point a reporter asked them, well, you know, what's it like at home? You're, you're in one of those very traditional difficult places where artists are at risk for expressing themselves uh, if it's in conflict with uh, religious leaders in that, that place. And he looked at him and he said, well, you know, Art is like water on the fire of fundamentalism. And you know, that's it. It's, 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 so, uh, it's so important to see each other as human beings. And we do that through arts and culture and through expressing ourselves and letting other communities express themselves. So we try to do this on a community to community level, but we, we, we do it by supporting the artists, the leaders among us, the musicians, the people who communicate on beyond the language of diplomacy that's only in language. Thank you so much, Stacey. And I know I, for one, have really had the benefit of being a part of those programs firsthand. So I, I can attest to everything you're doing and, and the power and the impact that it has on both sides of the exchange. Turning to Pedro, buenos dias, Pedro. It's great to have you with us. Um, I, my mother's Mexican and I've spent a lot of time in Mexico City, so I'm especially excited to, to have you on the panel. Your work is so varied and it includes so many different forms of art that address important social issues. And these issues face all of us. In broader terms, can you share with the audience a little bit about your views on the important role artists play in creating safe spaces for people to address these social challenges? Uh, I am a sculptor, so I think that what sculptors do is to give shape to matter, not to, to transform and to give it a, a different shape. So uh, I think, for instance, uh, one of the projects that, you know, when, when one embraces a cause, you kind of have to stick with it, no? And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 I, I, this weekend, for instance, I will be planting some trees. Uh, that the, is a project that started 10 years ago, uh, or actually more like 15 years ago, which is this project called Palas por Pistolas, where uh, we melt guns and we turn that metal into shovels, and then we plant trees no? with those shovels. And, uh, and, and that is uh, something that is basically this operation for, where there was a gun, now there's a tree. And, and this is like a kind, this has been the, a project that I've been doing for 
15 years now. And, and, and what I witnessed was something important, which was that it was necessary to give uh, materiality to these intentions that we have. Because uh, the physical transformation of that metal that was engineered to kill, uh, and now plays a different role, which is like sowing uh, 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 life, uh, also triggered a psychological transformation and hopefully a social transformation. Because what people need is opportunities to get together to talk about these things that feel uh, unsurmountable, no? like kind of a very, very difficult to, to tackle. Um, but I think that is, it is very important that when you, for instance, if you say, okay, let's make a protest about gun availability, no? that, that there's a kind of a, uh, one of the worst uh, uh, problems that, that, that is that, you know, like that, that weapons are so easily available to anyone. Uh, you have to have a positive uh, or lighthearted aspect to this. So for instance, like planting the trees, which, wa which is a kind of a, almost like a picnic. No, you feel that you're doing something for the planet. You're, you, you, are, you are planting a living monument that we, you will see grow. And it's very nice to see how trees that you know people planted 10 years ago and that were only like uh, three feet tall now they're kind of uh, a large no and uh, and so I think that when we're trying to 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 deal with violence or with uh, a death and suffering it's important to craft a transformative experience, experience where you will close on a positive note and a hopeful note. And that transformation of matter, but also of spirit is, I think, what you could call a social sculpture. No? This, this, uh, this, this, this journey where we have to change the polarity and to turn the negative into positive. Wow, well said. And, and I just love the idea of a social sculpture. I've been following that project for a long time. Congratulations, Pedro. Really exciting. Uh, I'd like to turn back to Art for our next question. But before doing so, uh, we really want to encourage questions from our audience here today. If you have any questions you'd like to ask our panelists, please put them in the chat. We'd love to hear where you're coming from, uh, your name, and, and maybe the city you're from, or the state, or perhaps the country if you're joining us from abroad. So Art, let's turn back to you. Could you tell our audience a little bit more about the important work you're doing with the Culinary Diplomacy Project and how they could get involved? Excuse me, I take a sip of my tea from Salon from India as I enjoy the grapefruit that thanks to Barbados we have. Um, you know, that's one of the things I think if we would, again, you know, we just think about where our food comes from. If you love the food, you love the people. You know, with the Culinary Federation Project, um, it's uh, the, the Culinary Diplomacy Project, it enables us to do some amazing things. We did an incredible trip to Jordan. Jordan is one of the most beautiful ancient kingdoms. And we were able to go to this, the Syrian refugee camp and cook with these amazing women. One of the first things I do when I go to any place is I go to the market and I see what people consume. If you look at the food, you learn to know the people and you see the simplicity of it. And, you know, when we travel, we, of course, you know, we're drawn to the antiquities and the culture and everything, which is very, very important. But the rowdy is observing the people, the customs and their food tells you so much about them. You know, sitting down at the table, understanding, you know, meze and how that works and all the different components and going to an old, probably the oldest market in all of Amman and having the king's favorite shawarma. And as you see how it's made by hand and how we collect the bread from the Netrokal bakery, it was truly wonderful. 
um, one of the most amazing things we did, we went to a part to these uh, families' home, and they prepared this meal that was on a table that seemed like it went forever and ever and ever, and they made all these dishes, and and it was just this, it was just generosity that you just cannot believe, and. Um, it's the, I love the Middle East. I love the culture. I love the coffee. I love the tea. I love the, the, the way that it's so important and family and coming together. And we've been able, which is quite difficult to actually go into homes and, and work where, you know, I went to Agaba and I was uh, there and, and cooked with, made a wonderful, um, a dish with the family there and then we shared it on the beach together i you know i sat in the desert of the roddy rum and with the bedouins and cooked and and you know which was truly amazing um to really understand the harsh environment and how these ancient people have survived in this culture um I think what's interesting is like what we said before is the ability to share. I mean, you know, the thing is this food is food. If it tastes good, we all love it. Doesn't matter what it is. Um, we all have different tastes. Um, some cultures prefer sour and salty and sweet over others. Um, you find that a lot um, in, you know, in parts of the world. Um, but it's, it's gaining that appreciation and understanding where what food does, food goes beyond politics. And as we are there to, it's only as catalysts to create conversation. And also through the conversation, we cook. And with the culinary diplomacy project, the objective is, it's just that we're go there to, to really, uh, emerge ourselves in the culture. And when we leave, we leave, we leave there with something that maybe it's just sharing of dishes. When we went to a culinary school, we, I taught them my great grandmother's um, chicken and dumplings. And, you know, it, and I told them, I was said, I was really so thrilled to make my grandmother's chicken and great grandmother's chicken and dumplings because to know that her great grandson is making that recipe. And, and I said to them, I said, do you make recipes of your ancestors? And they say, yes. And I mean, I think it's, it's showing that, that truly that connection. And, um, you know, it we- It sounds like, delicious. Our, and I, I have a feeling that I, I just hope that, you know, you can share these, these stories and anecdotes because it, it ties into so much beyond food, but really tradition, I get the sense from what right. you're speaking about. And what I love about Pedro talking about taking the guns and making shovels and planting trees, one of my favorite stories, I don't want to talk too much, was I had the honor to cook for Professor Wangari Mafai, who won the Nobel Laurent for planting trees. And I made her breakfast. In the South, we serve dessert with breakfast. <laughs> and, I was, and I was expressing to Dr. Mafai, I said, um, we, we, serve, we serve dessert. And she said, well, I want to go where you're from. <laughs> which was fairly sweet. And I, so I, the whole point is, is that, and but through her tree planting, she was totally able to change whole ecosystems in Kenya. Well, thank you so much. And I, I think I also want to go where you're from. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is making me salivate here. Um, well, before I, I run to the kitchen, let's turn to Stacy. Uh, Stacy, before we dive deeper into the amazing work that you're doing, I'd love to share with the audience a video that highlights the broad range of cultural diplomacy programs led by the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs at the State Department. Enjoy.
sharing a warm hearted applause for the work that you're leading, Stacy. I know many members of the audience may not be familiar with the depth and the breadth of the diplomatic exchange programs led by the State Department. With the necessary increase of virtual exchanges and digital content platforms, there still remains an important void to address with the temporary absence of people-to-people -people exchanges. I wonder if you could speak to the important impact that true people-to-people -people exchange programs offer that the virtual programs perhaps can't address. Sure. Um, I think a lot of people probably first heard about cultural diplomacy through the jazz ambassadors who the State Department sent abroad in the 40s and 50s, uh, even before our own country had made the progress uh, in, in, uh, in uh, equality and justice. We were sending some of the best of America abroad through our jazz ambassadors. And that kind of in-person programming continues to this day. Um, and it's definitely our preference and we can't wait to get back on the road. But our experience during the last year was that the temporary pause of in-person programming actually led to an expansion of exchange options rather than a void. I mean, if you think about it, uh, culture is something that we can bring and bridges um, distance uh, through digital ways as well as in person. Of course, there's nothing like the energy generated with US jazz, bluegrass, rock musicians, slam poets, dancers, architects, aerosol artists, filmmakers, and speculative fiction writers when they gather together with their peers from around the world for an in-person exchange. However, during this time, we've been able to expand this both to communities who might be in remote locations, difficult to access things, and for our artists, who for various reasons have a hard time traveling. You know, we, we do like to, to experience and to show all the different aspects of American values through our programs, um, including things like rights for the disabled. We have done uh, amazing things with our artists who are differently abled. And I often say I have one of the best jobs in the State Department because I'm always reading cables, which are our kind of letters from our embassies and consulates abroad, about some wonderful, magical moment that happened there because of one of these programs. And just this week, I was reading about uh, in Latin America when one of the artists that we saw featured in that reel did a program with young people there. Um, which, you know, came, came back with the wonder and awe of seeing someone who is uh, differently abled, who had a physical disability, being out there and in a public role and having a life and a lifestyle. So all those things are continuing to happen now. And uh, I think that using experts in the U.S. and international arts and educational communities whose travel schedules would sometimes not allow them to go abroad, uh, they're being able to do this too. So we're continuing to, to build on these virtual elements. We're back in touch with alumni of earlier exchange programs and just about everything that you can think of from design to uh, STEM and the arts, uh, to culinary diplomacy, uh, to filmmaking and media makers, we're doing some kind of an exchange. So let me just take the opportunity to also thank the American taxpayers who are looking at this because thanks to you, we're taking off a little piece of our, of our State Department budget and having a huge impact with these kinds of cultural programs. Thank you so much for that, Stacy, and, and I also wanna join in thinking because I, I feel I've benefited so much as well. So thank you very much. Uh, turning to Pedro, Pedro, you've told us a little bit about your project, Palas por Pistolas, and I know you also have the related program, Disarm, which has done such an incredible job spotlighting gun violence in Mexico. I wonder if you could speak about the ways in which your art has provided an approachable and easy to understand platform for audiences to reflect, to learn, and to address these and other important social issues. Uh, well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, uh, well, after seeing what, I, what the shovels have done, I realized that the most powerful thing was to see people come together and that a work of art could be a sort of catalyzer for an activity. So what I decided to do next with weapons was musical instruments. 
uh, I have one word right here, for instance, which is one of my favorites, that is a flute. And this is just a rifle that has uh, holes that mm -hmm. are made in the right spot, so it can be a cool. uh, functional flute. And for me, it's like a kind of almost mystical weapon because it talks about like something that where ballistics were, you know, like all the technology was used to, to produce the most possible harm. And that now uh, it, 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 it produces music. So for me, music is the opposite of, 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 of weapons because weapons are the rule of fear and music is a rule of trust. And, uh, and, and, and when, you, when you have a performance where people are playing with the musical instruments, they're all connected by the same uh, expression and the same experience. So you have a sort of communion of, uh, of, uh, through the same uh, emotional uh, and rhythmical experience. Uh, I have another piece here, which is a guitar. Made also of uh, guns, so wow. you see, for instance, like the the parts of a revolver may come like the knobs of this electric guitar. And these are clips from a machine gun or from a AK AK forty seven, and and this is like a kind of collage where, from arranging these metal parts in a table, I work with a welder putting them together, and we have created we have turned 7,000 instruments into musical, 7,000 weapons into different musical instruments wow. that now are different orchestras. And what these kind of sets of instruments do is that they go to a country. And in that country, local musicians play with these instruments. But one thing that is for me important is to, uh, to kind of uh, talk about the, the, the fact that it's, I'm not talking about Mexico here. I'm talking about a global issue, which is the global weapon trade. And I believe that we often put blame on whoever pulls the trigger, but the violence starts where the weapons are made in the factory. And, uh, and there's no scrutiny about the companies that profit from causing death and suffering around the world. And I think, and, and actually, you know, like what, what I was doing recently was to do music boxes uh, where we were working with specific brands of guns. So for instance, I made a music box with a Glock, the, 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 the Austrian, a brand and and we may we use only parts from Glock guns and we made a music box that played Mozart who's also Austrian and and we and you know and and then I made one with Veretta which is an Italian brand and it played Vivaldi hmm. the series is called mm -hmm. Return to Sender and it was like a kind of a, a sort of <laughs> cultural diplomacy but it was trying to, you know, like a give a, a denomination and an origin to where these weapons are made, because we often think that uh, we only think at the end user. And I believe that there's enough weapons in the world that we could stop altogether the production of weapons and the world would only be a better place. So I think that all that oftentimes there's a racial bias where we talk about, when we talk about violence we, and, 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 and the people who produce the weapons are totally off the hook. So I think that, uh, you know, like what, what we have to tackle is uh, the, 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 the sector of industry that, that uh, only produces harm and suffering and that nobody's talking about that. I'm really glad that you brought that point up, Pedro. I've, I've followed the project very closely uh, and I'm a huge fan. And I think you're shedding light on questions that really need to be addressed. Thank you for explaining more about that project. 
We have just over five minutes and many questions from the audience. Um, so maybe in, in a sort of rapid fire response here, if you will, I'm gonna address a couple of questions uh, to each of our panelists, starting with Stacy. Stacy, this you have two questions. The first is from Vicki Heyman. What is the most impactful cultural program you've worked on in your 30 years in State Department history? And in addition, a question from Athena Shea for Stacy. What are the biggest factors State Department takes into account when deciding which types of programs to prioritize? Big questions. Perhaps if you could just offer a, a short answer and uh, we'll try to provide more context later via links and such. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Vicki, you really put me on the spot here. I have to say, um, every program that we go through is almost the most impactful for the people that participate in that one because uh, they're life-changing experiences. Uh, I have to say in the last 10 years, one of the biggest one has been American Film Showcase. Uh, and that is a program which takes American documentaries about all aspects of life abroad. And as many of our artists here have been talking about, they start a conversation, they start a dialogue about different topics. And it's not a dialogue based on, let us tell you how to do things or how to fix things. It's a, it's a dialogue about, this is happening in, in our society. This is a closer look at this. And uh, we can talk together about um, these issues, the art, the, the making of the film, all the different aspects of it, and give people a voice who don't necessarily have a voice. And that's one of the beauties of documentary making. So I just mentioned that one right off, um, but I, because it's, it's hard to say what is the most, because every one of them has the, the impact needed for that community uh, at that time. And that's what makes them all so special. Great. And Stacey, if we have a chance, maybe we can return to um, Athena's question about the biggest factors for the State Department, um, which they would take into account deciding on, on the programs. Uh, let, let me turn to Art. Um, Art, we have a question from Randy Levine. Uh, Pedro mentioned the psychological change through the arts. How does your view, how do you view the psychological change caused by food? Give us a, a brief answer there, if you don't mind. When you feed people, you make them happy. And I think that food is one of the most universal ways to create happiness. Um, it, and it just involve, it envelops us. And, and I think that it goes back to what our mothers taught us, share your food and the sharing of it. And I think it, it does create, create, create happiness. And, um, but it also makes them even happier if you exchange with them and say, let me make that dish with you. Would you please teach me rather than you going as in as a teacher, you go in as a student. Mm. And that brings great joy. That's a great answer. Thank you so much, Art. Uh, turning to Pedro, a question from, from my friend, Nora Halpern. Hi, Nora. Uh, Pedro, how has COVID changed your practice? Are there lessons learned from this past year that you will carry forth in your work moving forward? and what is your newest project? So that's three questions. Um, if you could maybe just provide us a brief answer on, on those, that would be great. Thank you. Well, um, I think that COVID uh, was just like, uh, well, it was, it first it made me stay uh, in the studio more uh, because I wasn't traveling, which allowed me to spend more time in with my work. And obviously when you spend some time the artwork becomes better. So I am very happy with the results, although, you know, like, a, a, so it, it, I mean, like, this is strange to say, but you know, like a, as an artist personally, for me, it was actually like a opportunity, no? Uh, despite all the sad things that involved. Um, what am I working now? Um, well, it's still in the issue of disarmament, but now I'm helping two organizations, which is the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, to remind people about the problem of nuclear war. Because this, you know, uh, if you remember in the 70s and, well, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it was a big, big, big issue. And after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it seems that people kind of forgot about it. 
but there's still 13,000 uh, nuclear warheads ready to go off any second. And uh, nobody's talking about this. Like for instance, younger generations like millennials or generation C or generation alpha, if you ask them about like what is in their top 10 worries, none will tell you uh, that the world may end uh, with a nuclear war. And this is, and the non-proliferation treaty is expiring now, you know, like a, it was supposed to uh, have a, the UN was supposed to have a, a summit in August. It has been postponed to May. But the, when, once the NPT uh, ends, because, you know, like a, there's very small likelihood that it will be renewed, uh, we were, were going to start a new arms race. And there's like all the countries that now have nuclear weapons are ready to spend billions of dollars on new nuclear weapons. So this is something that we're trying to do to, to put in the attention of, of, uh, of the general public and, and inspire new activisms like the act, you know, we, we like activisms from the 60s and 70s and 80s made a reduction in nuclear arsenals from 90,000 uh, nuclear bombs to 13,000, which is where we are now. But it's time to a full ban on nuclear weapons. And this is something that it, it, should, it shouldn't be controversial. You know, like a, it, this, this is about the future of the planet. We should ban nuclear weapons. Pedro, I couldn't agree more. And it sounds like a really very, very impactful next step for the project. We'll look forward to seeing how that develops. Uh, Stacy, I wonder if you might have had a chance to consider uh, Athena's question. Athena Shea asked about the yes. biggest factors in determining uh, programming to prioritize. Yes, uh, it's a very much a collaborative process. We collaborate and cooperate with our, our partners, uh, the arts institutions who have expertise. We have cooperative agreements every year, a creative artist uh, grant competitive process. And we sort of set the priorities based on uh, policy issues around the world, but always with an eye to reflecting American priorities and American culture. All the things you've been talking about in the Meridian Fix across today are things that are important to us. Diversity, inclusion, equity, peace building, reconciliation, expertise in artistry, willingness to share with communities, bringing hope dialogues through that way. So if you ever want to go into the website for the State Department, state.gov, and look through cultural programs, you'll see there's quite an array of different programs with different opportunities to audition, to put forward ideas, and to work with us collaboratively in the future. It's wonderful, Stacey, and, and I highly recommend that you do check that out. Again, I, I've had the chance to benefit directly as an mm -hmm. arts envoy for 16 years, and, and the programming you're doing is amazing. I want to thank uh, Meridian International once again for putting together this panel. I know I've learned a lot here uh, from, from all three of you today. Thank you so much. And perhaps a closing thought. I know we've, we've spoken about the power of using the arts, including culinary arts, um, as a diplomatic tool. And many times we, we speak of the arts as sort of the universal language. Uh, I, I've come to see this a little bit differently. For me, our universal is our human capacity to feel to feel emotion. And I, I see the arts as a vehicle, a gateway, if you will, that invites us to an even more powerful tool. And that's to open our imagination. It's to have this capacity to imagine a better world, uh, to imagine you know, the kinds of collaborations art has spoken about. And, and certainly Stacy and Pedro, when you showed us those instruments, I mean, that's something completely in it, innovative. How could we imagine a better world? And I think the arts can play a very, very strong role. And all three of you are working in that regard. So thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you, Meridian. And looking forward to the rest of the day here at Culture Fix. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.